Okay, great. Good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to have the group uh, from Stanford present today, Yuri Leskovic and, and his group, Serena and others, who will present their recent work on modeling infectious diseases, especially in context of COVID. Uh, Yuri is an old colleague of ours and been working for together for now close to 10 years, 11 years, I quite don't remember. And this is a really cool piece of work. I'm going to let him talk about it and tell you where it's going to be appearing very soon and uh, small restrictions we have for the next few days. But with that, Yure, welcome. Serena, welcome. And thank you very much for doing this. Thank you very much for having us and for uh, uh, we are very excited to be a part of this NSF project. And what I wanted to talk to you, to you about is a very recent work that we started immediately as the pandemic broke out. And as um, uh, Madao said, uh, this will be published in Nature on Tuesday for next week. So this is kind of the first presentation to this closed group about the work we've done. And, and then as of next week, this will actually be public and there will be a press briefing uh, and all that. And we are also talking about how to release this as a tool or how could, how could we uh, increase the impact of our work together with Madao. Any kind of feedback you have would be super useful. If people have questions, you can use the chat. I have it uh, next to me, so I'll be able to read it and answer questions. Thank you for coming. So let me kind of tell you the, the story. And this is really a joint work with three students at Stanford, Serena, Emma, and Pang Wei, and then Jaline and Beth, who are epidemiologists and sociologists at Northwestern, and David Grusky, who's a social science professor at Stanford. And the way we came together was actually that we were doing research about socioeconomic segregation, right? We wanted to understand how people in U.S. are segregated. And the way usually segregation is being done is that it's a static measure. You ask where people live, what is their home, and then you are asking how close are you know, people with different socioeconomic backgrounds, how close do they live to each other? And that's the measure of how do we usually try to quantify segregation. And we've been working on this project for the last year about how could we use location-based data to really estimate how people interact with each other rather than, you know, say how diverse are the people who kind of sleep or uh, live next to each other. And we started this project where we used cell phone data and tracked how people move around to really understand how people from different backgrounds, how often do they meet with each other? And this way really measure segregation or diversity of the people we encounter throughout the day. And this was a cool project we've been working on. And then basically the pandemic hit. And we started asking ourselves, can we help in any way? Could we contribute to the big questions that are um, around the pandemic? And of course, if you look what was happening in the, in the news or how much do we know about this, we know quite little, right? And here I show you some examples of news articles back from March, uh, April timeframe. And, uh, you know, different countries took very different approaches to this. Different politicians took very different approaches to this. And as, as the progress, uh, right, this was kind of the, the initial set. Then the next set was the, basically that big parts of the world went into the lockdown. And now we are basically having the second lockdown uh, here in Europe. And of course, as this has been evolving, there was also a significant backlash in a sense that are all these uh, lockdowns, stay at home and so on, are they really needed? And what is the effect of them? And here is the, uh, an editorial from the New York Times from uh, a month ago uh, that kind of nicely summarizes what do we know and how little we know about the pandemic, how it's spreading, and how how do we uh, how do we fight it? So this is basically where we where we come in and we ask: Can we help answer any of the questions in terms of can we help understand how does people's mobility and stay at home orders? How are they suppressing or stopping the virus from spreading? And also, we were interested to know, could we build models that would tell us how could we potentially open uh, the economy so that we keep the virus in check? And I, I realized that what I'll be talking today about is kind of a small part of these big questions and that these questions are, as much as they are scientific, they are also political and they have many other nuances to them that kind of I won't be addressing today. So this is where we started. And before we started, I should also say that 
we acknowledge and understand that modeling is super hard. And one reason why modeling is also so hard is because the underlying behavior of the population is changing all the time, right? So if you are just trying to extrapolate or make predictions out of the number of cases or deaths over time, then you have to constantly refit the model because the behavior of the underlying population is, is changing. So we were interested in saying, could we kind of fit one model and we wouldn't have to refit it every so often? And the way we, 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 we come into this is to say, okay, let's make a step back and start from the fundamentals and see if we can build something up from there. And kind of what we decided to, to be using and thinking about will be this very kind of uh, simple basic epidemiological models where basically every individual in the, in the simulation is going through a set of states starting with being susceptible and then you know with a kind of certain probability if they meet somebody else who is infectious they can they become exposed and after being exposed they become infectious and they can infect others and after some time an individual recovers right and really there is this kind of fundamental parameter let's call it beta that will tell us how likely is an exposed susceptible person and how likely do they become infectious and really, if we are talking about using these types of models, then it is really about understanding the underlying network, the underlying contact network that tells us who is in contact with whom and which infectious person is, is exposing uh, which other susceptible person. So it means that there is this underlying contact network that modulates the spread of the virus. And of course, the virus will spread very differently if, if a person that is infected resides in very different parts of the network, right? So in this, and, 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 and this is kind of what we are interested to understanding better. And what is kind of the problem or what is one of the hard parts in epidemiological modeling today is that we don't understand or we don't know what is the underlying network, right? We don't know how people are in contact with each other. So the contacts could be like the network here on the left or, or the network on the right. And of course, given a different network, the dynamics of the spread might be very, very different. And because we don't have a good way to estimate the network generally today, we would be assuming in many of these models that the network is fully connected, right? That everyone can kind of infect everyone else. And this is really kind of the assumption uh, that we want to challenge. So basically our work starts from the observation that human mobility and human contact patterns are crucial for us to accurately model the spread uh, of the virus. So what we started our work with back in March was to say, how could we accurately estimate the dynamic contact network for you know, 100 million people? Can, is that possible? And, and if we have that network, perhaps we can then build a model on top of it. So basically our main premise was that if we estimate dynamic human contact network, then virus modeling will be kind of accurate even if we use relatively simple models. And if we are able to estimate the contact network, then we will be able to answer a lot of interesting what if questions in terms of social, social distancing and what kind of effect does it have or how could we relax or uh, reopen the economy. So uh, this is how we started. And the data that we are using will be this data coming from cell phones where we know how people come in contact with each other. And we will do this for 10 largest US metropolitan areas that combined have about 100 million population. And we are going to estimate this contact network for every hour of the day, right? So for every hour of the day, for three months, we will have a different inferred contact network that we are going then use to model the virus, right? So that's essentially the main idea of this work. So the way we, we do this is that we, we are going, our goal is to estimate the contact network, but we are not going to model each individual. We are going to kind of use a bit more aggregate model where we are going to model two types of locations. We are going to model uh, places where people stay at home. So we will call this uh, census block groups. This will be small areas of around 600 to about 3000 people. So you think of this as, as a neighborhood. Um, and then we are going to model also what we call points of interest. So this would be 
places to which people go. So restaurants, grocery stores, parks, churches, schools, fitness centers, gyms, uh, train stations, basically anything that has an address and is not a home is a point of interest. So this means that, you know, on one end, we'll have census blog groups, uh, think of them as uh, neighborhoods. And on the other end, we will have points of interest. And here in this plot, I'm borrowing from our colleagues at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where they actually put a yellow dot for every point of interest that we are using in our data set. And overall, we have about half a million points of interest and around 60,000 different neighborhoods of 60,000 different census block groups. And the way we are now going to create that contact network is that we are going to model how many people at every hour of the day from each census block group go to each point of interest. So we will have this bipartite network that will change every hour and the weight of the edge between the neighborhood and the point of interest will be the number of people from that neighborhood who went to that specific point of interest. In order for us to be able to do this, we will be using anonymized aggregated location data collected from cell phone applications. And we use two different data sets, something that is called a mobility data set that is released by the Safe Graph that basically tells us hourly visiting patterns to different points of interest. And also what they call a social distancing metrics data set that will tell us what fraction of the population in each census block group is staying at home at a given time of the day. And these, these data sets are all publicly available from, from this URL that I'm sharing here. So using this raw data as an input, we built a big pipeline that allows us to estimate this bipartite network of how people from census block groups visit points of interest for every hour of the day. So basically for every hour of the day, we are estimating a different network this network has 550,000 points of interest, nearly 60,000 neighborhoods or census block groups, and it changes every hour. Our modeling period is from early March to mid to end of May. So basically we have 24 networks per hour times seven times, uh, uh, times four times three or something like that, right? So we really infer a different network for every hour of every day in, in our observation period. Here I'm just showing you examples from these 10 largest metropolitan areas that we are modeling between March and May 2020, the number of census block groups, as well as the number of points of interest. For example, in New York City, we have 14,000 neighborhoods, 120,000 points of interest, and then around 20 million modeled population and about a billion different edges spanning between neighborhoods and points of interest. And then just to show you how these networks change over time, here is a network for Washington DC on March 2nd at 1 p.m. So this tells me at 1 p.m. on March 2nd, how many people from each census block group went to the different points of interest in Washington DC. This is March 2nd, this is April 6th. And just visually, you can see how much, let's say, mobility dropped and how mobility patterns changed between March and April. Now, these vertical lines, this basically means that people go to points of interest that are close to their home. They are in the same neighborhood as their home. And these diagonal, diagonal lines actually means that people travel to some other point of interest that is away from their home. So now that, that we have this dynamic network, we want to build a simple epidemiological model on top of it. Um, and the way uh, we do this is that we will do a simple SEIR model that basically models the state through which an individual transitions between being susceptible all the way to being recovered. And basically, this model will, will have three, three parameters that will be static through the entire duration of our observation period of our simulation. And these three parameters are basically transmission probability or transmission constant at a point of interest, transmission probability or, uh, at, the, at home, so at uh, the neighborhood level, and P0, which is the initial fraction of initially infected population. And as I said, these are three parameters that we use for the entire metropolitan area, and they remain fixed through the entire observation period or through the entire simulation. 
Now, how does the model work? It is essentially, we will take this bipartite network. We will initialize it with population staying at home. And uh, with P0, we are going to infect a certain fraction of the people staying at home. And now what we are going to do is we are going to use the network for that given hour of the day. We know what fraction of population from each CBG moves to the points of interest and to which points of interest they go. So we kind of move them to the points of interest. Now that people are at points of interest, they actually mix with each other and new infections get created. What is interesting and important here is that we also know what is the dwell time. So for every point of interest, we know how long do people stay there. And we also know the square foot area of the uh, place. So we can account both for people density as well as the time people stay there, right? So now people will get, the people go to points of interest, they get infected at points of interest, and now they, they go back home. And again, at home, they mix with each other and uh, new infections can occur. And now, right now that this has happened, basically we will update the network because there is a new hour of the day and people again will leave home to go to uh, points of interest and new infections are going to occur there. And this is basically the basic simulation that we are running. If I use the, the math to explain this, we are basically doing this in the following way. We simulate hour by hour from March to May, we initialize the census block group with a fraction of initially infected people. And then basically the idea of our model is that we iterate between steps one and two, where, where people from CBGs visit points of interest, people mix at points of interest and new infections get created. We account both for the dwell time as well as the area of the point of interest. So we kind of account for the density of people there. Here is our parameter about the infectiousness at the points of interest. And then people go back home, they mix there again, and more people get infected with this third parameter beta census blood group. And that's essentially all there is to the model. So of course, our model has many, many different constants. Uh, that I'm writing here, that we took values from the literature. And there are really just three different parameters or three different variables that we actually estimate and fit to the data, which are the two betas and the initial proportion of infectant or latent population. And this is basically it. So we have a model that has three fixed three parameters. We do grid search over different parameter values, and we use uh, 30 different realization for every parameter value, and we take the parameters that fit best to the reported number of detected cases uh, per day. And then uh, we select parameter sets that have the error within 20% of the best error, and we use these parameter sets to then estimate our confidence intervals. But essentially, this is uh, very simple, and this is how we, we uh, fit uh, the model. So the full modeling pipeline is, is here. We are using uh, basically the, the safe graph data here in the orange to estimate these mobility networks. We have the three free parameters that I was talking about. And then we fit the SIR model and based on the observed case counts to come up with the best parameter sets. And then, and then we run the experiments using this simple model with these three different parameters. And here on the left are different uh, data sources. So now that we have built these pipelines, the main question becomes, does this work, right? Is this actually going to work? Is it going to give accurate uh, predictions? So here I give you one example for uh, Chicago metropolitan area, where the way to think of this is x-axis is time, y-axis is daily confirmed cases as uh, reported by the New York Times. The x's are actually the confirmed cases, and um, orange is kind of a smooth version of the raw data. You can see that the raw data is very noisy. Uh, here we feed the model parameters between March 8 and April 15, and then we, we use those uh, parameters to run the model forward based on the mobility network. The model predictions are in blue and the data is in orange. 
this is basically our model trying to to kind of forecast forward and on the right is what if we fit the model parameters to the entire trajectory and you can see we get a quite good fit now this is for one metro area here it is for uh, the other nine uh, metropolitan areas and basically you can see that our model can fit very different patterns of infections quite well, right? So for example, here is New York City that had a big spike and then it died down. And you can see our model is able to fit that quite well. We have, for example, Dallas and Washington DC that are on the rise, or for example, Philadelphia and San Francisco, where basically it gets to some level and then it remained relatively flat. For example, in Miami, the fit is perhaps not that good. Houston, interestingly, similarly. Of course, what I should emphasize here is that these this, uh, case counts are not corrected in any way. So we did not try to correct them for the amount of testing and, and, and anything like that. These are just raw, raw case counts as reported uh, basically by the counties and then collected by the New York Times. So these are the model, uh, kind of the model predictions, and we see that the model can fit well even though the underlying population dynamics and population behavior has been changing drastically through this period that you know many different stay at home and all other different kinds of orders have been issued and that even though we only have three static parameters that are fixed over time we can relatively accurately fit these very different behaviors and, and different kind of phenomena so uh, this is from the modeling point of view I, I will also say that our goal, we realize that our model is kind of simple, but we wanted it to be simple because we wanted to demonstrate that the mobility network is an essential ingredient. So one could make the model kind of more realistic, more, uh, more complicated, add more features to it, and then, you know, it would, it would be only better. But our goal was to use kind of a bare bones uh, simplistic model to demonstrate that even simplicity can do, can do something useful here. So now that I kind of showed you our methodology and, and uh, demonstrated that we actually can fit quite well, I want to now talk about uh, four types of results that we have obtained. So we will, I will talk about trying to evaluate the impact of social distancing and stay at home orders, talk about the risk at different points of interest and identifying super spreader locations, We'll look at different simulations about the reopening the economy and also talk about some explanations why disparities in infection rates occur across different socioeconomic groups. So the first uh, question that, that you could ask is how much did social distancing and, and stay at home help at stopping spreading uh, COVID? What I show you in this graph is x-axis is time, y-axis is relatively foot traffic, so basically number of visits to uh, points of interest of different categories, like airports, bars, coffee shops, uh, hotels, movie theaters, and so on, right? And you can see how in mid-March, the visits to those places, especially, like, for example, uh, movie theaters and airports dropped uh, sharply, while, uh, for example, to supermarkets and general merchandise stores, it kind of dropped uh, less, but it still dropped for about, let's say, 20%. So the question is, how did this drop affect the spread of the virus? And the way we can model this is that in our case, right, we can take the real mobility data. Here I show it in, in black, and we can align it left and right, and we can scale it up and down. So basically, we can simulate various what-if scenarios where we could say, what if people wouldn't stay at home? What if they wouldn't reduce their mobility? What would happen? Or we can ask, what if people would reduce mobility, but perhaps seven days later, how would that affect the spread of the virus, right? So we can basically simulate the, the spread of the virus on this, let's say, hypothetical mobility network that we can simply obtain by taking real mobility and changing the magnitude of reduction, or we are sliding it in time left and right and see what happens. And what is, for example, interesting is that we see that the that reduction in mobility that, that we have observed in the data actually stopped the virus significantly. So if there would be no reduction in mobility, the, the cumulative number of infections 
uh, would grow as shown in the yellow line. And black here at the bottom is how the number of cases actually grew and what is predicted by our model. So you see this kind of huge discrepancy or huge gap between the two. And then, of course, we can also simulate what would happen, for example, if mobility reduction would only be 50% of actual. And this is, for example, the line that would, that would happen. What we can also simulate, for example, is that with no reduction in mobility, then 32% of the population would be infected by the end of the month, right? So basically, it, we would need to wait a month and a third of the population would be infected if people would keep their mobility traffic as, as they were doing it by the, let's say, at the end of February, right? So in this, in this period here. So that's the first observation, right? Is that the mobility reduction was very important. Another question you could ask, how about the timing when we made this reduction, right? What if we would reduce our mobility a week later or a week earlier, what would happen? And if we do that, we actually see that the effect of when the mobility reduction happens, again, I'm talking about days uh, before or days uh, later, didn't play that, that much role. So these are different uh, simulated scenarios. Zero is what actually happened, you know, seven days later, seven days earlier, uh, the differences are not that big, you know, less than a factor of two, which is interesting as well. So this is about the first set of questions. The second set of questions goes around different locations, different points of interest, and especially this concept of super spreaders. Because we simulate our model, we can actually count for every point of interest how many infections under our model happen at that point of interest. And of course, the infection rate at a given point of interest at a given time will depend both on the number of infectious visitors, number of susceptible visitors, the area of the point of interest, as well as the median dwell time. And this allows us basically to count, to simulate how many infections happen at a given point of interest, and then we can aggregate points of interest into categories and, and see where the most infections happen. What is interesting is that we find that about 10% of points of interest account for more than 85% of all infections, right? So it is really a small number of points of interest where people congregate very close to each other for long periods of time where most of the infections happen. And we find out that overall about 70% of all infections happen at points of interest. And then out of the 70%, 85% happen at just 10% of those points of interest. Right, so there is big kind of differences between different types of points of interest. So the spreading is not homogeneous. And then of course, for different categories here on the left, we can also calculate how many infections do they, do they contribute or what is the risk of a visit to that point of interest. And we see that, for example, full service restaurants, fitness centers, and snack bars, coffee shops are, are the riskiest, including you know, motels, hotels, religious organizations, you know, this would be churches, things like that, right? And these are basically the categories that are the riskiest. Notice the y-axis is logarithmic. So the riskiest ones are, you know, an order or two orders of magnitude riskier than, let's say, convenience stores or gas stations and so on. So this is about results around different types of points of interest. Now I want to kind of move to the question number three, which was about uh, reopening the economy. Right, like how, how can this model help us simulate what, how could one uh, reopen the economy? And this allows us to do that because, again, we can change mobility patterns and simulate different reopening strategies. We could say, let's just ramp up mobility back to 100% and use the mobility patterns people had before the pandemic. We could, for example, do occupancy capping, where we say we'll allow X fraction of the maximum occupancy at a given point of interest. And the third uh, way to reopen would be to say, let's just assume a uniform reduction in the number of visits at uh, POI by a given fraction. And the difference between the number two and number three is that occupancy capping means that we stop people when the occupancy goes about a different uh, a given threshold, while uniform reduction would mean we just uniformly throughout the hours of the day reduce the number of people who visit a point of interest. And if we do that, what do we find? 
in this graph on the left, what I'm showing is a fraction of visit lost from partial reopening versus fraction of infections. And this is the capping the numbers here on the plot. Tell me how am I capping the number of visitors relative to the maximum occupancy? And for example, if we are, if we were to cap at 10%, so we'd say you can have at most 10% of your maximum occupancy people in your store at any given time, you would be losing about, let's say, 65% of the business. And that would only cause uh, a certain number of new infections. And of course, if we would, let's say, reopen to 70% of the occupancy, then you would only be losing about, you know, uh, let's say uh, 5% of the, of the foot traffic, but it would lead to about, you know, three times, four times as many infections. And the point we find interesting is this one here, where we can set the occupancy to around uh, 20%. And this means we can, we can reduce the infections by more than 80% while losing about 40% of the foot traffic. So you could kind of simplify this and say that you are using about 42% of the total number of visits or of the total uh, business. And we also find, this is the graph here on, on the left, is that occupancy capping is always better than uniform reduction. And it's about, you know, gives us uh, fewer infections than uniform reduction. And then the last result I want to talk about is about emerging social disparities that come due to the lockdown. And it has been observed, for example, that coronavirus kills more Hispanics and Blacks than, let's say, whites. And it's unclear why is that or that, you know, African-Americans have a larger share of COVID infections and deaths. Some explanations why this might be happening uh, mostly go into the question that these are people with lower socioeconomic status, so they, they have many pre-existing conditions, and that could be the reason for higher mortality rate. And what we wanted to do in our case was actually to see, does our model capture any of these behaviors, right? So would our model kind of automatically learn, or does it emerge from our model as well, that a socially disadvantaged get hit harder by the coronavirus. And the way we do this is that we look at different neighborhoods based on the, in, on the socioeconomic status of that neighborhoods. And then we can observe whether, let's say, rich neighborhoods have fewer number of infected individuals as the poor ones based on our model. And again, note that in the model fitting, and the model itself has no clue what neighborhoods are rich and what neighborhoods are poor it is just simulating mobility and infections. And what we find, we find that our model, in fact, captures naturally this, this fact of these emerging social disparities. So basically, we are plotting here for different metropolitan areas, the relative infection risk between low and high income CBGs. And you can see that the relative infection risk is about 2x higher in low-income neighborhoods than in high-income neighborhoods. So basically, these social disparities emerge from our model as well, even though the model is not keeping track what is, let's say, socioeconomic status of different people. So we went to investigate this further and see what could be the reasons that these disparities emerge. The first thing we know, we observe, is that people from lower-income neighborhoods used their mobility less. So what I show you here, some examples, the people with lowest income, people with the highest income, their mobility over time, gold is high income, violet or pink, violet is low income. And you see how the violet line is always above the, the yellow line. So it means that low income people reduced their mobility much less than the high income people did. For example, here in Dallas, it almost seems like a factor of two different reduction. So this is the first fact. The second interesting fact that emerges is that points of interest visited by people from lower income neighborhoods have higher transmission rates, meaning that we, we saw that the median transmission rate when a person goes to grocery store and that person comes from a low income neighborhood is about two times bigger than for a person from a high income neighborhood to go to the grocery store. And the question is, why is a single trip to the grocery store twice, twice more dangerous for a low income individual? 
and what we find is that, that the places to which low-income individuals go, there is about 60% more hourly visitors per square foot than for high-income individuals. So basically, low-income individuals go to more densely packed places and they stay there longer. They stay there 17% longer on average than what high-income individuals do. Right. And so basically it's the differences in mobility and differences in the places these people go to, how packed they are and how long they stay that that explain or are one of the factors in explanations for the emergence of these social disparities. So to what I want to do now in the last few minutes is I want to kind of uh, wrap up, conclude and, and give some discussion. So first is that the way we see our work is, of course, there are certain limitations, right? We are using cell phone data that perhaps does not cover all the different populations and, of course, is not complete in terms of all the points of interest and so on, but still it has a very, very good coverage. And it is also important that in, in exchange for simplicity, our model does not, let's say, include all the relevant features that one would perhaps wish to model with a more complicated model. So, for example, we don't account for asymptomatic transmissions. We don't account for any kind of changes in hand washing behavior or any changes in mask wearing behavior or any kind of age related variation in, in mobility and susceptibility to the virus. So these ingredients are not part of our model. We keep it kind of sweet and, and simple. Of course, these are some of the limitations. What are some opportunities for future work is definitely to take our model and extend it. It would be interesting to include these additional ingredients around age, asymptomatic cases, mask wearing, and also analyze further the structure of mobility networks and their impact on the model in terms of how much heterogeneity is there across different, different nodes, different neighborhoods, different points of interest and better understand when are these super fine-grained mobility networks or contact networks necessary and at what resolution to be able to model the spread of the infectious disease. And, you know, to conclude and say what are the important takeaways here, this is really about modeling large number of people, so basically 100 million people with a very fine-grained mobility network that changes every hour of every day and basically this and using this dynamic network then even a relatively simple model can lead to accurate fit of the case trajectories across 10 very different u.s metropolitan areas this is a very scalable model we have half a million points of interest 100 million people and, and we can run this quite scalably we ran over uh, 2 million different realizations of this model and this fine grain mobility really allows us to capturing micro trends down to individual neighborhoods and locations, right? So we can do a lot of what if analysis and measurement based on these mobility patterns. And kind of the high level conclusion is that this fine grained analysis can inform more effective and equitable response to the COVID pandemic. So with this, I'm done. Thank you very much. This is the working title of the paper and the preprint that you can read at the link below. And as I said, uh, starting Monday next week, the paper will be public and uh, you'll be able to get it from the journal as well. So with this, I'm done and uh, very happy to take questions and thank you for coming to the talk. Great talk, Yure. Excellent, as always. Great work. I talked to you, so I'm not I'm going to hog the type. I'm going to let others ask questions and, and Golda can, can moderate it, but I will talk to you separately. Thank you very much. Uh, so I see Srini has a question. You want to go ahead, Srini? Hi, Ray. This was an excellent talk. I've looked at your mid-archive earlier, but it was really exciting to listen to you explain this result. I think, first of all, thanks for all the students also, like who would have managed all these large data sets, just wrangling them together would have been very difficult. So one question I had in terms of your assumption for modeling within the POI, I noticed that you were talking about quadratic dependence on dwell time and inverse on area. So were you doing something like a bouncing ball kind of model inside the POI or could you explain how you arrived at such models? Yeah, I mean, we, we were 
inside the POI, we basically did uh, exactly as I wrote on my formula here, right? So basically we are just assuming that people are kind of uniformly mixed inside the point of interest. And the way we came up with this air, dividing by area and quadratic on the dwell time is based on the, based on the literature. So uh, this, is, this is what others have done before us, and we simply adopted that. Okay, yeah. The other question, like the beta, beta POI and beta CBG that you talk about, these are single numbers throughout the entire metro, or, right? Like it's not per POI or it's not scaled for indoor, outdoor kind of things or not. Exactly. It, this is one number that we use for all POIs and one number that we use for all CBGs. And do so they this, is not, this is not a, a half a million dimensional mm -hmm. vector. This is one number. Yeah, that, that's that's the, the impressive part of it. So does it vary across the metros or did you even fix that? Uh, we would fit beta, uh, betas and P0 for every, for every metropolitan area. So here is, here is the slide with parameter, uh, parameter fits for every metropolitan area. Right, you see these numbers are kind of round because we were doing grid search, but you know, these are the numbers. Nice. Maybe there's some pattern there also. Like, but yeah, very interesting work. Thank you. Thank you for questions. I saw Aditya. I think you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Hey, hey, Yuri. Aditya here. Uh, so nice work and talk. I just had a quick question. So there's this sense of there are a lot of missing infections and unreported infections, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. Do you have a sense of how that might affect any of your calibration results or you take that into account or do you have any implications on that part? That's a great question. I mean, we did not try to, or we did not account for those things. Our calibration period for, for these plots was basically a month and a week to demonstrate that how well we can fit. And then for our experiments, for some claims we make later, we actually fit on the entire period. So you know, these early parts, even if even what you say was happening, we did not we did not account for it, and it's only a smaller part of this longer two month period. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Yuri. Yep. And Serena, if you would like to add anything. So Serena is my co-author, the lead author on the paper. If I don't answer anything entirely <laughs> correctly, please correct. That was a good answer. I mean, regarding the thing about time varying detection rates, I think it is a good point. But like Yuri was mentioning, the period in which it would probably be the most varying would be in the beginning. And because we fitted using root mean squared error, that also does bias towards the periods with higher infection rates. Another thing is we did do a sensitivity analysis where instead of fitting to the daily reported cases, we tried fitting to daily reported deaths as well. And we showed that our model basically had the same findings and could fit equally well in both cases. And so it suggests that it doesn't depend too much on these little uh, sensitivities. Great. Uh, then I think there are a few questions in the chat, unless there are more. We'll start with Giovanni's question in the chat. Notice that in your figures that the two of the cities with weaker fits are Miami and Atlanta. Do you have thoughts for why? Is it related to geography or are there other idiosyncrasies in the spike in July? That's an excellent question. Like I would say we haven't really investigated to have a good answer. I don't know, Serena, do you have a sense? We haven't discussed this. Yeah, so you can see that Miami and Atlanta are very noisy. So that might be part of it. So you see the little X's, the gray X's represent the actual data that we are working with. And we only smoothed it for the purpose of visualization, but we fit the model to the raw data, not the smooth data. So maybe that has to do with part of it. But this is an interesting question that I think we can investigate more in future work. Yeah, that's a good point. You can see, for example, the variance of the daily case counts as reported by these different axes. And it's all over the map, right? Like Atlanta is terrible. Miami has a lot. San Francisco has surprisingly a lot. While, for example, Washington, New York are much, uh, are much tighter. So they could have used very different uh, testing regimes uh, that perhaps were far from perfect. And there's a question from Chris Barrett. Have you thought about how you would use such models for detailed mitigation management? I mean, that's exactly what we think this is very useful for. 
right? Is because it allows you to, to do these types of very, very fine grain analysis. And because we can estimate these networks practically in real time, you, you can imagine how this would be very useful for uh, decision makers where, where, you know, after they have instituted a given measure, you can immediately see how the behavior of the population has changed. And you don't need to wait two weeks to start seeing infections in your tests. So, I mean, I, I think it's kind of a huge number of possibilities of uh, how this could be used. It's, of course, also, I think, very, very sensitive because it's about real, real lives and real people and real businesses and so on. But you could, you could imagine that public policy person, a health official, could ask many different questions around what if we close this, what if we mandate this measure, how would this change the spread of the virus. Uh, you could run forward simulations, you could do kind of now casting, which would still mean that you get to see things in real time rather than with a two-week delay. So these are kind of some of the thoughts. And, and we, together with MADA, we are building towards a tool that could be used by, by the officials. Another question from Zakaria is two questions. What tool has been used to process such large and temporarily changing mobility network? And how much look aheadness is achieved in terms of predicting the case rate uh, with this model? From my understanding, in order to predict the case rate of today, this model would need the mobility network up to yesterday. Great question. So number one is, the first one is we wrote all the code ourselves and we are making it publicly available and anyone is able to use it. And also all this uh, network inference uh, code we wrote in a, in a scalable way and, and it's in, in public domain available on GitHub. So anyone is able to uh, use it. Now, how much look aheadness do we achieve? Uh, two weeks. We, in, in our model here, uh, we actually, actually here, is, here is the fixed parameter. We get one week. So we basically assume whoever gets infected today we are going to confirm deterministically seven days later. Of course, this is, a, again, a very simplistic way of looking at this, but this means that if we have the, the network up to today, we can say how many cases are we going to detect seven days later. So it's kind of now casting with a seven-day look ahead. From Galen, uh, thanks for the talk. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your decision to make the graph bipartite. Was it a question of tractability or was CBG to CBG travel uh, only a small portion of all travel? Uh, that's a great question. Ha, there are several answers. I think the, the important answer is that you want to include points of interest because we are spending uh, a lot of time there. It, these are the places where people mix, uh, where people from very different parts can come and mix together in close proximity. So that kind of we wanted to have. Now you are entirely correct that we are kind of ignoring a cross CBG travel that is not to a point of interest. So you still go from one CBG to another to a point of interest, but you don't go to another person's house in that CBG. That, that type of travel uh, we, we are not uh, accounting for. There are two reasons. One is that we, the most important is that uh, we don't have the individual level data. So we only have this kind of CBG point of interest level data. So SafeGraph did not make the individual level data available. The second thing is we kind of didn't want to work with individual level data just for privacy and, and data sensitivity reasons. I mean, you can imagine this is very sensitive data. And yeah, it's a good question whether adding this additional part of mobility would make, a, would make a big difference. And one question in the chat from Jiaming. Do the parameters like beta and gamma, are they location specific or general for all places? They, this was, yeah, this was asked before. They are general for all places, right? There is one beta CBG for all the points of interest in Atlanta. You know, there's another one for everything in Chicago. But basically, if you want to model Chicago, you need to know these three numbers. Right, so it's a very simple model. So all the points of interest have the same uh, infectiousness parameter. Of course, what is different is that different points of interest have different dwell time and different area 
as well as uh, number of visitors, the, the density of visitors and fraction of infected people at that point of interest will be different. But they all have the same value of the beta. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. Thank you to Yura and Serena for sharing this great talk. Please join us in two weeks on November 19th. Uh, we'll have Junmei Deng from Virginia Tech speaking at our next seminar. Yure, Serena, Emma, uh, Peng, this is just excellent work. Thank you very, very much for sharing with us. And I'll be in touch with you folks. Yeah, thank you. Thank have you. a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you.